The last two years have been turbulent for energy markets. A chain of factors pushed up the price of fossil fuels, triggering a global energy crisis. And this made waves through almost all aspects of our economies. Recently, prices have started to come back down, but the shock has left its mark. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm here in Sintra, Portugal, at the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Every year, policymakers and academics from all over the world meet here to discuss what is shaping our economies. One of the talks focused on structural changes in energy markets and what these mean for inflation. And that's what we'll be discussing here today. What's changing in energy markets? And what do these changes mean for our economies and for our work as central banks? I'm very pleased to be joined today by Central Bank Governor Ida Voldenbacher from a country that is crucial to the world's energy supply, Norway. Ida, welcome to the ECB podcast. Well, thank you. It's very nice to be here. Now, energy markets have seen significant change over the past years, especially in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, as, as supply bottlenecks and increased demand really pushed up energy prices. In 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused a big shock across Europe's economies, aggravating these changes and, and further increasing prices. And at the same time of all this, countries are striving to make their economies greener to combat climate change. So that's a lot that's been happening recently either. What has this multitude of shocks meant for the shape of energy markets? What kind of changes have we been seeing? Well, as you say, uh, the energy markets are indeed undergoing uh, rapid uh, changes shaped by pandemic, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and not least the necessary uh, green transition. And while the transition will yield uh, benefits over the long term, uh, the transition need not be seamless. And we've seen over the past year uh, that mismatches of demand uh, have caused fluctuations in energy prices as clean energy is not being built fast enough uh, to, uh, as while fossil fuels are being phased out. Uh, and I think also going forward, although it's very difficult to predict uh, the level of energy prices or the evolution of energy markets uh, over the coming years, that will uh, be affected by technological development, the supply of raw materials and minerals, as well as uh, public policies related both to climate but also to uh, energy security. I think we must prepare, though, for uh, larger volatility of uh, energy prices and perhaps also more persistent and long-lasting changes in energy prices. And that could, again, uh, challenge central banks. And what struck me in your panel discussions this morning about the changes in energy markets was just how many factors are shaping the energy markets and, and affecting prices as well, and also in how many directions we need to be looking. Because, of course, what happens in energy markets ultimately feeds its way through the system to you and I, the consumers, and most obviously in, in the price that we pay for fuel and, and for heating, but it also can have more far-reaching implications on things like the kind of transport we use or, or how we heat our homes. These structural changes that you were just discussing, how do they impact our daily lives concretely? What, what, what have we seen there? I think the most obvious effect, uh, as you alluded to, was uh, the effects that we've seen over the past year in the sharp rise in our energy bills, which is affecting uh, families uh, and also firms who have uh, passed these, these uh, cost changes on to, uh, to their output prices, uh, being a main contributor uh, behind the surge in inflation that we've seen over the past year. And that has had uh, a large impact on, on many people's uh, people lives uh, mm. over the past year. But also, as you say, our, our economies are undergoing a, a huge transition. Uh, and in Norway, you will uh, at least see uh, now the majority of new cars being sold are electric cars. Mm. Uh, and you can also see uh, different measures being taken to, to improve the energy efficiency of both uh, households and firms. I want to zoom in actually now mm. on, on Norway. Mm. It, the country is one of the world's largest exporters of oil and, and it's pivotal to Europe's energy markets, having now replaced Russia as Europe's main supplier of gas, right? 
You also mentioned, I think, in your panel this morning that Norway has also become a flexible supplier of hydroelectric power. So it's really pivotal uh, to Europe's energy markets. All these changes that we've been talking about, how have they affected Norway specifically? So our uh, electricity consumption is mainly covered by hydropower. Uh, and we are part of the uh, European energy market. So in fact, Norwegian uh, consumers of electricity um, experience the same kind of surge in their energy bills as uh, their uh, European counterparts last mm. year. So that has been felt by both, uh, both households and firms in Norway. Uh, but yes, uh, Norway is a large exporter of, of oil and of natural gas, and natural gas has increased in importance uh, over the past decade. Uh, and so as a response to, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we've ramped up uh, our production of natural gas and increased uh, the supply of gas to Europe. And I think the close cooperation with Europe reflects our, our common interest in well-functioning um, energy markets in the transition to, to net zero. And there's also a lot of cooperation in the area of, uh, of uh, other renewable energy sources. Um, as regards the effects on the Norwegian economy, um, now obviously uh, the high natural gas prices generate large revenues for the uh, oil companies, mm. uh, but a large part of those revenues accrue to the government. Uh, and uh, those revenues are again, to a large extent, transferred to our sovereign wealth fund, the government pension fund global. So in that sense, although it does generate activity uh, in the Norwegian economy, uh, it's in part insulated from, from short run fluctuations in energy prices and has over some time. So a large part of the petroleum wealth has been transformed into financial wealth in our sovereign wealth fund. Okay. That will be, I can assume, important as you move away from, from petroleum. Absolutely, because in the years to come, uh, the uh, petroleum sector's significance to the Norwegian economy will likely decline as the resources on the continental shelf are depleted mm. and uh, substantial investment and also reallocation of uh, resources across uh, firms and sectors will uh, likely be uh, needed. But along that path, the uh, green transition can actually be a, a catalyst, and we're seeing now that the technologies that have been used in petroleum in the petroleum sector are now uh, a springboard for new jobs in the green sector. I want to look forward a little bit now and I mean I, I mentioned at the beginning energy prices are going back down but the shock the shock and, and the shifts that, that it is causing energy markets will be felt for a long time and with no end in sight at the moment to Russia's war in Ukraine uncertainties very much remain in the global energy situation. We also heard on your panel this morning just how difficult it is to predict in what way things will go. And a couple of points stood out for me in particular. Number one, the fact that we're on this global shift to net zero with high investment in renewables. But at the same time, demand for gas and coal is still at, at very high levels. So it's almost like they're going, they're moving in different directions. And then the other one was the fact that as the use of renewables like solar and wind power increases, the weather will play a much bigger role. And of course, predicting the weather beyond short timeframes is, is incredibly tough. So if we look to the future, how you, you already mentioned a couple of ways, but how can we make our economies more resilient to, to shocks and, and changes of this kind? Yeah, that is a complex issue. As you say, the, the, uh, the transition is itself complex and there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding uh, the future evolution of, of the energy system and the transition uh, itself uh, obviously. Uh, it's also a big question uh, and uh, I guess for, for political authorities and fiscal authorities mainly to, to, to address. Uh, but to say a few words about we, how we as central banks can, uh, can uh, what our role uh, would be. I would first like to say that uh, we too need to, to deepen our understanding of energy markets. It's not just one energy market, there are multiple markets and they interact in complex ways. So we need to get those into our models to uh, improve our forecasting uh, framework and be able to understand the sources driving the fluctuations. Um, at the same time, we should be prepared for prices to be more volatile and perhaps more persistent. Mm. Uh, and that could offer uh, more challenging trade-offs for central banks. Uh, as on the one hand, uh, if changes are more persistent, then 
spillover and second round effects to other prices and, and wages might be amplified. Uh, and if we fail to respond to that, we could risk uh, inflation overshooting our targets and inflation expectations becoming de-anchored, uh, which would uh, also uh, not be helpful for the transition going forward. On the other hand, if we uh, wrongly interpret temporary changes as more persistent, we could uh, in fact, uh, incur output losses and inflation volatility could increase. Uh, so those are challenging trade-offs that the central bank will have to face. And I think having a sufficiently forward-looking approach, uh, but with the eyes uh, fixed on uh, anchoring inflation expectations and our fl inflation targets uh, will be a good starting point. Very good. Well, thank you, Ida, for coming and joining the conversation and, and providing these insights on this super interesting topic. Now, before we wrap up, we always have a question that we ask all our guests on the podcast, and that is for a hot tip linked to the topic we're discussing today. So broadly speaking, energy markets, energy crisis changes uh, in, in, in energy. Have you thought of something to inspire our listeners? Well, I have thought about that, and I must admit that uh, as a central banker over the past year, I've been quite busy, so I haven't uh, been uh, reading uh, a lot of books or, or <laughs> watching uh, films for, for that matter. But now going into the holiday season, I'm looking forward to, to uh, reading up on, uh, among other things, the energy market. Uh, and one book that I have uh, on my list is Daniel Jurgen's uh, The New Map, Energy, Climate and the Clash of Nations. That, I've come, that comes highly recommended. So I look forward to that. Brilliant. Well, that sounds super interesting and also super timely. The new map, Energy, Climate and the Clash of Nations. Maybe one for my summer reading as well. I want to thank you so much again, Ida, um, for joining the conversation and providing your in insights today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for more on this topic. We'll also be sure to add a link to the full panel discussion on energy markets from the ECB Forum on Central Banking, in case you missed it. You've been listening to the ECB Podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.